Welcome back to Fast Gadgets. Today I'd like to talk about something that to me is very interesting. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but I like to look at businesses and look at the philosophy that they create and what they use to move their business forward and what type of business model they work under. Uh, especially technology companies, of course. That's what I'm mostly interested in. Well, recently I was working on some videos and doing some editing and some other work. And what I was doing was I had my TV set up and it was on YouTube and I had it, um, well, it's always set for this, but it's set to automatically play videos. And it got on some videos that were Steve Jobs talking about uh, Apple in some of the Macworld addresses that he did historically. And one of the ones that I was watching was from 1999. And I begin to realize that his philosophy was really um, incredibly intelligent and he had the uh, wherewithal and the understanding of the business model that he was operating under. And I really think we would have seen a very different uh, Apple today if Steve Jobs were still alive. And I want to play a few video clips for you and let you see what I was talking about. So this first clip I want to play uh, Steve Jobs talks about his relationship with Microsoft and I'm gonna play the clip and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it now <clears throat> there were a lot of developers I'd love to have up on the stage today but I picked one out <clears throat> and uh, in a second I'm gonna actually invite Ben Waldman from Microsoft up here on the stage and I want to invite Ben up because I know there's been a lot of uh, controversy surrounding the DOJ trial recently uh, we've tried to stay out of it, but we couldn't. We got subpoenaed by both sides. And <clears throat> we found ourselves in it to some extent. But I wanted to say a few words about that, because our relationship with Microsoft, it's kind of like a marriage, um, it's terrific about 99% of the time. About 99% of the conversations we have are about making great products for Macintosh customers. And about 1% of the time we argue over stuff, usually having to do with multimedia. And, you know, in life, that's not a bad ratio. That's not a bad ratio. And I have the privilege of working with a lot of the Microsoft folks, and in particular Ben Waldman, who I think is one of the most passionate Macintosh developers on the planet. So I wanted Ben to come out here and show us some new things that they're working on, that they're announcing today. And I'm proud to be working with Ben. Ben Waldman, the general manager of the Microsoft Business Unit, All right, so you saw the clip, you know what I'm talking about. He actually is very intelligent when it comes to business arrangements with other companies. He didn't see Microsoft necessarily as a direct competitor for every single thing. He actually was able to understand and work with Microsoft to actually get his products, Apple's products, to market. I think that what he was able to do uh, with Microsoft showed that, you know, his capability, uh, basically as the CEO, moved Apple forward and made it able to design new products, but they didn't have to create all the different software uh, themselves. They actually could use Microsoft software. So it was really something interesting, and I wonder today, if it had been possible, if Steve Jobs were still around and Microsoft was doing what it was today with some of the hardware innovation that they've come up with and the software they've come up with, uh, like the Studio Dial, would this have been something that Apple would have used to collaborate with Microsoft, not just on software, but on hardware as well? I could have seen that in, in as a possibility. Um, but unfortunately, as it stands with Cook, I feel like what he is good at is you know, kind of a bean counter. He's good at running the company, and he understands and is able to analyze current trends. But the CEO position shouldn't be somebody who's a good manager of assets currently necessarily. Well, they should have that skill, but not the only skill. Uh, what Jobs was really good at was being a visionary and looking at the future. That's what I think he was good at. All right, we're back. And it looks like 
I was just about to run out of battery, I didn't realize that I actually um, had been running off of battery all that time. I had the laptop in another room and I was working for several hours and I plugged it into the computer, but it wasn't actually plugged into the uh, plug in the in the socket, so I wasn't getting any juice. So anyway, we're back. The next item that I wanted to discuss was the fact that back in the day, Apple actually cared quite a bit about games. Uh, today, I don't get that feeling. I think they really want to get this... Uh, professional kind of look and air about their products and the software that it provides. Yes, there are games available for it. Yes, it can do some gaming. Um, like it or not, I, I think they have a curious preoccupation with ATI Radeon and ATI um, GPUs in general, but I'm not sure why. I think they would be better off, you know, and mo a lot of people ask this, why aren't they putting... Uh, NVIDIA 1060s or 1070s in these new professional uh, MacBook Pros. It really would have upped the game quite a bit. So, well, that's neither here nor there. But looking in the past, uh, Steve Jobs, his philosophy, his belief was that you know, as much as work and productivity are important, so is relaxation, um, enjoying something, you know, taking a break. And this next clip I'm going to play, he talks about his philosophy on games. Let's watch. Now, there's one other topic I want to talk about today while we're talking about applications, <clears throat> and that's games. We recommitted Apple to games nine months ago, and we've been working really hard on this. Matter of fact, one of the things we did was we got the best and most respected authors of the best games together to beat us up. And we let them, and we listened to them. And we're really trying to take their advice and implement it. And I think we're doing a pretty good job. And you've seen some of it in the new Power Macintosh G3. You've seen some of it in OpenGL. And the gaming community has really responded. Now, we want to be the best gaming platform in the world. And today, I'm going to show you 12 of the hottest games on the market that are all coming to the Macintosh. Some of them are shipping today, the rest of them are shipping all of them within 120 days from now. These are all public commitments, many of them being made at Macworld here today. Tomb Raider 3, <clears throat> the successor to the incredibly popular Tomb Raider 2. Very hot game. Myth 2. <clears throat> SimCity 3000, great game. This is from uh, Electronic Arts. <clears throat> Fly. You know, Macintosh has never had a great flight simulator. This is coming from the folks that do the Microsoft flight simulator, and it's hot. <coughs> Rainbow Six from Tom Clancy. <coughs> Imperialism 2. StarCraft. Really huge game. <coughs> coming to the Mac. Heretic 2. <coughs> Battlezone. Quest for Glory 5. Age of Empires from Microsoft and Matsoft. Very popular game. And Quake. So what did you think of that list of games, those 10 games that he had cited? I think in the day, uh, that would have been an incredible list. And again, uh, some of the games that he cited, the Microsoft Age of Empires, he's basically saying these games are going to be designed and made to run on an Apple platform. And at the time, it was the G3. So again, um, looking at this philosophy and... Maybe today Apple doesn't see money in it. Maybe they're not concerned about it at all because they can't see any reason why they should increase the MacBook Pro platform or its ability to run games as well as Windows computers do. I really don't know. You know, they may be so entrenched in the whole iPhone iPhone camp. They may think that, you know, they're making enough phones or making enough money. There's really no reason to be producing um, hardware and software and an operating system that can play games that could be it it's hard to say now, next and last section I want to show for you was the one for me that was the most amazing I'm just gonna go ahead and play it and let you listen to what he has to say and then we'll come back and we'll talk but there's about one it. other thing you see design we don't think design is just how it looks we think design is how it works and we labored a lot on this because our pro customers want accessibility. They know there's a lot of great technology inside, but they want access to that technology instantly to add memory, to add cards, to add drives. And so 
we think we've got the most incredible access story in the business. And you know what it's called? Let's get the video up here. It's called a door. <laughs> we just open this thing here, and there it is. <laughs> open the door and there it is. There's a gigabyte of memory, there's the processor, there's the three disk drive bays right there, the four slots, all the removable drives. You, this thing even runs with the door open. It's totally accessible. And when you want to close it, you just button it up. And there's a lock on the back so that people you, you don't want. Inside. So he says that what the users want is accessibility, uh, expandability, upgradability. They want to have the ability to open up the computer, get inside it, change, add hard drives, add memory if you want. And you saw with the iMac G3, it still had memory slots available. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Now, there are people who say, yes, but you know, in order to speed up computers, we can't have uh, interchangeable parts. Well, that's not true. You really can have computers, even modern computers. Uh, that will allow you to take the memory out or take the SSD out. Well, with the MacBook Pro 15-inch or the 13-inch with the touch bar, you cannot replace the SSD. You cannot replace the memory. At the very least, being able to replace the memory and being able to replace uh, you know, the SSD are huge. On this computer I'm shooting on right now, my Yoga 2, although I can't replace the memory, at the very least, you know, I had a 256 gig SSD that it came with. I went ahead and bought a one terabyte SSD, put it in. I was up and running very easily. There was nothing to it. So we still need that ability to do. And we still have computers out there. Actually, I should say we have newer computers, some gaming laptops. Uh, yes, they're more expensive, but where you can switch out the GPU. Now, that is incredibly powerful to be able to exchange the GPU. So my thinking is, when you think about Steve Jobs' philosophy, how he was so adamant about the ability to support games, the ability to work with other companies, um, to make computers that were expandable and not expendable. So basically you buy a computer when it isn't doing what you need for it, you throw it away. Um, I have a 2011 MacBook Pro. I put in 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD. I still have it. I'm not going to get rid of it. Um, even though I have the newer MacBook Pro 2015, quite frankly, that computer is able to do some things that this one can. It has more storage. It has more memory, so I can run more virtual machines on it if I want to, for example. Is it slower in the processor? Yes, but still extremely useful. So Steve Jobs was worried about, I won't say he was worried, but he, in his vision he knew that you know having expandable systems was important. Now I grant the iMac G3 is a far cry from a MacBook Pro, but I still think there are some elements that could be upgradable in the MacBook Pro, and we should still be able to have that ability. Think about the Mac Pro. How we went from a full tower case. Uh, I was watching another video where he was talking about the, the original release of the first Mac Pro. And, you know, he was talking about how it could have so many CPUs, its upgradability with the memory and so on. And now we have the, the last version, I guess, which I believe was 2014, was the Trash Can Mac Pro, which has limited upgradability. Uh, so... Do we really care about thinness? What's your opinion? Do you care how much thinner the Mac Pro gets or the MacBook Pro? Well, I should say how much smaller the Mac Pro gets and how much thinner the MacBook Pro gets. The thing that I am a little bit concerned about is the weight. So I really do like it when the weight goes down. Um, but, you know, the fact is I'm... I find it's acceptable. My Lenovo Yoga 2 here is about 3 pounds. You know, the MacBook Pro now is at 3 pounds. 3 pounds is definitely acceptable. That is a, a very easy machine to carry long term, uh, f you know, if you're going somewhere. Now, my MacBook Pro 2011 was much, much heavier, but I still threw it in my backpack and carried it. So, uh, if you've been around as long as I have, we don't really... <laughs> 
we think, I do anyway, that having uh, something as thin and light as this Yoga 2 is absolutely incredible. Back in the day, I had to carry five or six pound laptops around, you know, not to... Uh, and in addition to that, their power brick, which was another, you know, pound or so. So um, I think thinness is thin enough. We've gotten to where we need to go. And if you need an ultra portable, you could just buy a MacBook, uh, which, you know, if I had the money, I probably would buy one. But the thing that really would stop me, even if I had the money, would be a couple more ports on it, even if they were USB-C. If I was really concerned about size and lightness, that would be something I would consider buying if I had the money for it. Should we be considering utility, expandability, and the you know just plain the ability to change the memory or add an SSD? Let me know what you think. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching. If you did enjoy it, like and subscribe, and please share. And I will see you next time.